I have the honor of um, introducing to you the Dean's Awards recipients for 2019. Uh, I'm going to begin, yes, indeed. I'm going to begin um, on your left. Uh, Lily Piccone uh, is this year's recipient of our Dean's Staff Award. Um, Lily serves as FES's Strategic Enrollment and Communications Officer. She is the life force behind almost every single special event and recruitment initiative at our faculty. She is the first to volunteer for a task and the last to stay at an event, maybe even tonight. <laughs> Lily's creativity and initiative shines through her spearheading of Change Your World and the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals Training Weekend which has been organized with York and community partners and has inspired hundreds of high school students to follow their passion about environmental issues and leadership. Lily is collegial, collaborative, dedicated, and hardworking. We are absolutely privileged to have her in our midst. Congratulations, Lily. I would like to now honor Lisa Myers, who is on your right on the couch. Uh, Lisa is the recipient of the Dean's Teaching Award for 2019. Lisa embodies teaching excellence in every interaction that she has with students and colleagues in the classroom and beyond. She's generous with her time, spirit, and creativity, facilitating a warm, welcoming learning environment. Lisa's undergraduate teaching evaluations are outstanding, in fact, they're off the charts, and she's highly sought after as a graduate supervisor and mentor. Lisa has been vital to invigorating FES's community arts spaces, including our physical galleries, our media arts center, and the Eco Arts Festival, which was just held a few weeks ago. Uh, Lisa has been ensuring that these experiential education sites remain core to our curriculum. Lisa has also shaped innovative programming and in, in environmental arts and challenges students to explore diverse ways of knowing and being. We are privileged to have Lisa as part of our FES community. Congratulations. And last but not least, Sheila Cola is this year's recipient of the Dean's Community Engagement Award sitting in the middle between our other two awardees. <laughs> Sheila is an outstanding researcher committed to knowledge mobilization and community engagement. Her research focuses on pollinator conservation, and she was among the first to raise the alarm about bumblebee declines in Ontario. Her work expands well beyond monitoring, uh, these important insects. She has written numerous cons uh, conservation status assessments and recovery strategies so that conservation organizations may act quickly on emerging information. Sheila has partnered with the Wildlife Preservation Canada um, group as well as the Toronto Zoo and the African Lion Safari to foster s conservation breeding programs and she's extended this beyond bumblebees to butterflies as well. Outside the lab you'll find Sheila giving endless public talks media interviews, and collaborating with graduate students and faculty members at FES and beyond on innovative interdisciplinary projects that draw in key stakeholders from civil society, industry, and government. We are also privileged to have Sheila in our midst. Thank you very much. Again, let's have a round of applause for all three of our awardees this year. <laughs> Wonderful. <Thank you. laughs> all right, everyone. We're going to get back to our program. I hope everyone is enjoying the mix and mingle moments. And I hope everyone has taken advantage of dessert and some caffeinated beverages. So we have, as you can tell, we have a really jam-packed program. So of course we have done our time traveling through the first 25 years, sprung ahead to our Dean's Award winners, and now I'm so pleased to offer you a bit of a student showcase. 
And so I have another few lucky people up here on the couch who I will uh, introduce in turn. And we've given them uh, a pretty uh, intense task of uh, having one PowerPoint slide to talk to you about the research that they are involved with. So I'm going to begin with Madeline Lavin. She's an MES candidate, uh, and she's going to be um, talking to us about, uh, this is the title of her talk, B is for bug, o, o is for oikos, colon, a partial dictionary of household anthropods. So Madeline's area of concentration is close to my heart, which is multi-species studies, uh, and she specifically looks at human anthropod relations. She holds a diploma in environmental and sustainability education, and her uh, year of graduation is 2019. I know, yeah. <laughs> And after graduation, Madeline plans to explore avenues for publishing her MES major research paper in the hopes of finding meaningful employment in the field of education to both develop and facilitate environmental programming. She also plans to pursue a PhD. So we're really excited to have Madeline share with, her, share with us her research. So please welcome Madeline to the mic. Okay, I'm just gonna lower this. Um, so first of all, I'd like to thank the Faculty of Environmental Studies for inviting graduate students to present their research at today's event. As an alumnus of the Bachelor of Environmental Studies program and a current master's student, I'm so excited to be here to celebrate the 50th anniversary of FES. During my undergrad, I took a course that was taught by Professor Lisa Fawcett on human-non-human -human animal relations. In the final paper for this course, I tackled the issue of pesticides and looked at the rhetoric that fuels their continued use. At the time, I was also working on my senior honors thesis on honeybees and honey production, and I realized that I had been constructing a hierarchy between bees and other insects that I was not able to justify. The work that I began as an undergraduate student ultimately led to my decision to return to FES for my master's degree, and that was in order to explore human perceptions of insects and other arthropods more deeply. So today I will be speaking about my major research paper, which I just submitted to the dossier this morning before coming up here. <laughs> my work was uh, supervised by Kate Sandilands, who's not here today, um, and it is titled B is for Bug, O is for Oikos, a household dictionary of, uh, partial dictionary of household arthropods. So if you don't know, arthropods are invertebrate animals that include insects, arachnids, myriapods, and crustaceans. There are seemingly limitless opportunities to explore the worlds of bugs, which is part of the reason that I initially chose to limit the scope of my research to the household. But also because the indoor environment, particularly the home, is where human beings have the most intimate contact with these organisms. My major research paper is a partial abecedary that functions as a dictionary for the unusual and near invisible realms of some of the various arthropods that one might encounter in modern North American homes. I envision the human household as a multi-species assemblage and weave together threads from the sciences and humanities as well as anecdotes from my own experiences of bugs in my home. The assemblage thus serves as both a metaphor and a map for my exploration of the situated relations between humans and arthropods. I draw on a materialist approach that considers the inter and interactions between humans and non-human animals, plants, objects, and things in, in the home. The species I explore are for the most part those that have cosmopolitan distributions and have specific adaptations that allow them to live alongside us. In our dwelling places, our oikos. In venturing into the unknown, und sometimes undiscovered, or often simply overlooked landscapes of human households, a rich microcosm of life emerges. And by simply remaining open and curious in the most mundane of places, we can make our worlds more vivid. Scientists are also now turning their attention to the indoor biome, looking at the ecology of the, of the built environment. Current research identifies this environment as an area that's vastly understudied and in need of further investigation. I pair the scientific study of arthropods with a phenomenological exploration of the life worlds of these creatures in order to discover why it is that they make their homes alongside ours, raising the question of who is what and to whom. Household arthropods have likewise not been considered in great detail in the social sciences or humanities. 
Given this lack of attention, I saw this as an important area to which my research could, con could contribute. North American human dwellings are also home to an average of 93 different species of arthropods, many of whom may be characterized as pests simply for their presence indoors when in fact they cause no harm to people or their belongings. Through my research, I call into question the definition of a pest and challenge some of the commonly held perceptions of these organisms. My objective in exploring these relationships within the home is to stay with the trouble, following Donna Haraway, and consider what it might mean to both live and die well with these creatures by envisioning a present in which humans accept these bugs and our shared life histories as simply a part of life. Ultimately, it's my hope that we can at least grow to tolerate arthropods if not develop some level of respect for their presence on Earth. Jared Diamond writes of the problem that spiders and insects are no longer worth the cultural investment of teaching kids to differentiate species. Akin to what Robert McFarlane calls lost words when he writes, once upon a time, words began to vanish from the language of children. They disappeared so quietly that almost no one noticed at first, fading away like water on stone. The words were those that children used to name the natural world around them. Of course, McFarland's scope is much broader here, but the point holds for our relationship with bugs. Education about and the ability to identify different kinds of bugs is an important part of dispelling some of the myths surrounding these creatures. But there are many other reasons that identification is important. To identify those that are or may be dangerous to human health, those whose populations in high numbers can destroy property or damage foodstuffs, those at risk of extinction, or possibly just identifying species for the fun of it. In the context of my work as a whole and in each of the entries of my dictionary, I gather together multiple and various aspects of our relationship with these creatures, characterizing each of the entries as more exploratory than argumentative. So I'd like to conclude by just briefly speaking about the five specific animals that I explore in my major research paper. For each of these bugs, I've illustrated an original line drawing which you can see on the slide. In the top left is the bed bug. I trace the history of the common bed bug from its first documented association with humanity in ancient Egypt through to the present day and imagine what it might be like to see it as simply a part of life so as to find ways in which we can live with this organism. In the bottom right is the house centipede, possibly the strangest and most uncanny of all arthropods found in the home. The double meaning of uncanny, referring to that which is both familiar and frightening, plays into some of the broader discourse on the house centipede, insofar as it's simultaneously characterized as both pest and pest control in the home. In the top right is the book louse, for which I wrote a piece of speculative fabulation that provided an opportunity to constructively anthropomorphize the life of this common household insect. In the bottom left is the black widow. My entry S is for spiders, focuses on the fear of spiders, arachnophobia, which is quite common in Western society. This entry seeks to dispel some misconceptions about these creatures. Lastly, in the central image is the tick. My major paper concludes by leaving the home and the arthropods found therein for a brief foray in a meadow to encounter the tick. And then I explore the difficulties surrounding the host-specific parasites of endangered species and question whether or not humans should care if tick species go extinct. Thank you so much for listening. Um, wow, and that's a master's uh, <laughs> major paper. That is impressive, uh, and we really need to have coffee uh, to talk about that. Um, let me turn now to Victoria McPhail. Um, Victoria is a PhD candidate in the Faculty of Environmental Studies, and she studies the value of citizen science for bumblebee conservation. Her year of graduation uh, is estimated to be 2020, so it's coming up. And after graduation, Victoria hopes to pursue her passion for research, education, and conservation in an environmental field. And I will say that Victoria has been on a pretty intensive uh, speaking uh, media tour, uh, and I'm so pleased that she's here to share with, uh, share with us today her exciting research. So please welcome Victoria.
Yes, thanks, Dean, and thanks to all of you for attending. It is an exciting thing to realize it's been 50 years of FES. And I actually am a mature student. I did my undergrad and master's in the traditional way, and then decided to take a break from studying to actually go into the quote-unquote real world and get some work experience. But when I was out there, I started realizing there's so much information out there, more questions to be asked that can sometimes be answered through, you know, private sector research, so to speak. And so my advisor, Dr. Kohler, approached me, saying, would you be interested in doing a PhD? He's like, yeah, actually, I think this would work. And the cool thing about FES is it's very interdisciplinary. So I come at it with a natural science background, but actually I'm starting to tie in social science into my work. And so as the, uh, the dean announced, I'm much interest, very interested in bumblebees and bumblebee conservation. And the sort of different tack I take onto this question, or this topic, is using citizen science data. So citizen science is basically getting individuals, usually volunteers, involved in data collection. This has been going on since you know, early days of um, natural history studies where people just as hobbies would identify and collect you know, plants and animals. And through to today when people are using their smartphones to take pictures of, of bugs, like yeah, household bugs, there's now apps to identify what, is this, what are these bugs in my home. And so I'm trying to tie in this type of data into more traditional research. And so this type of program we're using is called Bumblebee Watch. And I want all of you to remember Bumblebee Watch. Go home and look it up on the website if you have a smartphone with you, download the app. It's a way of getting people to submit observations of bumblebees from across North America. All you need to do is take a picture of the bumblebee, submit it to the website or through the app, and we'll identify it for you. So it tells you, hey, what species do I have in my backyard? And it tells us so much information. And I'll get into that um, in a moment, but just remember Bumblebee Watch. Um, so its first launch, actually before I started my PhD, back in about 2014, and we've already had, I think, like 40,000 records submitted. Now 40,000 may not sound a lot, like a lot of records to birders, who for eBird, a similar program, gets millions of observations, but it's a huge amount of information for us. And already in just the sort of four years it's been writing, we found new records of rare species, we found really northern locations, I don't know if you can see in the map, but we have records from way up in Nunavut, up in um, Northwest Territories, across Canada, everywhere. Um, not everywhere, but we're getting a really good sampling of, of records. So it's giving us information about when other species emerging from hibernation. Literally any day now, the first bumblebee queens will be coming out here in Ontario, and this gives us information about when are they coming out, and when they do come out, what are they feeding on. So a lot of this basic natural history information, we don't actually know. Bumblebees are sort of cute, fuzzy, we've been around, we've been studying them for hundreds of years, literally, but there's a lot of information we don't know. So we're able to use the citizen science data to help sort of fill in some of these blanks. And so as the Dean mentioned, I've been doing sort of, yeah, a media tour lately. Uh, Dr. Cole and I just published a paper last week uh, with a colleague from the US looking at the American bumblebee, which its range just expands into the southern part of Ontario and Quebec. And unfortunately, we found it to be critically endangered. So it's had 89% decline in relative abundance in the last 10 years as compared to the previous 100 years, which is a real cause for concern. And it builds on previous research that Dr. Cole has been doing and I've been doing that shows that, yes, bumblebees are, so for some species at least, in decline, and we need to take action now to help, help save them. And while it's great for people to take action on a sort of personal level by planting flowers or participating in citizen science, it also shows a need for sort of higher level action, like advocacy work and affecting policy. So we're now able to use this data to affect policy. One example is a common eastern bumblebee. Um, it's, you see a picture of it in the very top, um, top left or top right, depending on you're looking at the screen. This is a species that's native to this part of Ontario and e indeed eastern Canada but it's used for greenhouse pollination. So people are managing it as a domesticated animal and shipping it across the country for greenhouse pollination, which is fine because we need greenhouse tomatoes or greenhouse squash or cucumbers. Uh, but the problem is the bees are escaping from the greenhouses and interacting with the bees in the wild. And also we're interacting with bees from outside of its range. So the picture on the top there actually shows a bumblebee mating. So the, it's a queen bumblebee of the common eastern species mating with a male. And this is in Vancouver. This is well outside of its range of sort of east of the Rockies. And this is a citizen science record. So the citizen scientists were kind of the, some of the ones who were raising the red flags about um, this species being basically an invasive species in, in BC now. And through citizen scientists, we can track the movement of this, this species. So we're actually able to use this to talk to different politicians and regulators saying, hey, we need to start regulating the movement of these colonies. And other research is showing you diseases are higher in these areas. So all these bits of information we start pulling together from both our typical field surveys as well as citizen science data. 
And other colleagues in our lab are using this data to, for example, find sites to study rare species. We want to ask the question of where are rare species in the landscape? Why does one species occur here and not there? Do different species need different habitats? Um, by finding these instances of currently occurring species, we can start answering these questions a bit more. And as Dr. Kohler's award nomination indicated, she's working with so many different partners on the, these topics and others. So citizen sciences is helping not just our own research, but that of other in institutions across Ontario and beyond. But it's not just research on the actual bees that we're interested in. We're also interested in the sort of person, the human side, kind of that social science angle. So we're curious as to for these people who submit photos, first off, why do they submit photos? And does participating change the behavior in any way? We sort of hope that by this program, people participate and get excited about bees, they want to learn about bees, but is this actually happening? And does it change their behavior? Um, so by using this type of data, we can start surveying the participants and learn that, yes, indeed, uh, we are finding impacts on the participants. They are loving the, the program. They loved learning about it. They're increasing their identification skills. Um, and yes, the desire to take action has been increasing. So I just want to give that little bit of a taste on the program. You can stay tuned for more information. Um, and yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Victoria. Another uh, amazing example of the interdisciplinarity of FES, the holistic approach that's taken, and this idea that it takes a village to produce environmental knowledge uh, and to then mobilize it into action. Thank you. I now want to turn our attention to Chance Finnegan, who is also a PhD candidate in the Faculty of Environmental Studies. Uh, his, area is con his area of concentration is in Indigenous Dimensions of Protected Area Management, and his uh, anticipated year of graduation is the summer of 2019, so right around the corner. And after graduation, Chance aspires to work to improve park uh, and Indigenous uh, relationships through the involvement in the public or academic sector. So please join me in welcoming Chance. So thank you to the Dean for that warm introduction. Again, my name is Chance Finnegan. Today, just a brief conversation about park indigenous relationships. Um, if you were to draw a very broad base sort of stereotype sort of statement, parks and indigenous peoples generally do not get along particularly well. And the further south you go from the territories, um, the truer that statement tends to hold. But there are some good examples out there of, of good, strong working relationships. The partnership that the U.S. National Park Service has with the Chinook Indian Nation at two national parks in the Pacific Northwest is a good example of one of these rare positive relationships. And so my work focuses on the work that the National Park Service does with the Chinook at Fort Vancouver National Historic Site, which is pictured here. So Fort Vancouver is a Hudson's Bay Company uh, fur trading post dating from the 1830s. Um, just outside of the right-hand side of the image there is the Columbia River. Directly across is the city of Portland, Oregon. I also work with the Chinook and Park Service out on the coast at the mouth of the Columbia at Lewis and Clark National Historical Park. This is a small historic site that commemorates where the Corps of Discovery spent the winter of 1806. The Corps of Discovery, of course, left uh, Missouri, or excuse me, left St. Louis, traveled up the Missouri River, and um, they were the first Euro-Americans to explore the Louisiana Purchase in the early 19th century. So some best practices, some lessons learned that have emerged from this work. Um, the first lesson is that um, strong park indigenous partnerships really depend on personal relations. So out on the coast at Lewis and Clark National Historical Park, the two parties have worked with the Washington State Historic Society to design a brand new unit of that historic site. Um, and this new unit is referred to as Middle Village. And rather than focus on the you know, few weeks that Lewis and Clark spent on the winter of the coast, Middle Village instead focuses on the 10,000 year Chinook heritage of the lower Columbia River. And the Chinook have made very clear to me that they feel the only reason that that park um, site was put together is simply that they had a very close relationship between their elected chair, the park superintendent at the time, and the Washington State Historic Society director at the time. Lesson number two is that turnover in park staff presents barriers. So also out on the coast at Lewis and Clark, the Park Service commissioned Tony Johnson, a Chinook elder, to carve a canoe named Oculum. 
Tony agreed to carve Oculum, but said that he would only do it if the Park Service allowed the Chinook to access it for um, community activities. Not just to honor his relationship with the canoe, but also because Chinookan style canoes must be in the water as a state of good repair, as a maintenance activity. So the park superintendent at the time said, yes, that's great. We would be happy for that to happen. And Tony carved Oculum. A few years later, a new park superintendent came on board and revoked community access to the canoe. And Oculum has since developed large cracks up and down both sides of the hull because it is no longer in the water, because the Park Service uh, denies Chinook access to it. So turnover in park superintendents is an issue. At Fort Vancouver, on the other hand, um, the superintendent and her management team have been there since about the year 2000. This is particularly unusual in the Park Service, and they have done a number of things with the Chinook since 2000. So an example of this is the reconstruction of the laborer's village. Uh, depending on the year, depending on the needs of the company, anywhere from 600 to 1,000 indigenous peoples from 36 different indigenous nations across the Oregon Territory lived in the laborer's village and supplied the, the raw manpower for the Hudson's Bay Company post there to succeed. So the superintendent and her team have been at Fort Vancouver since 2000, and because they have had stable long-term leadership, they were able to partner on a multi-year project with the Chinook to partially reconstruct the laborer's village. The third and final sort of lesson of this work is that small things, that gestures, that tokens matter. Um, a good example of this is once again out on the coast at Lewis and Clark. Once a year, every spring, John Burpee, the current superintendent, brings his staff up to Chinook Tribal Headquarters for helping with their spring cleanup day. So the Chinook not only have a tribal headquarters building and grounds to maintain, but they manage a small campground on behalf of the county government. And the Chinook Culture Committee has made very clear to me during each of our conversations that, you know, one day of, of manpower, one day of volunteer labor is not really all that much in the grand scheme of things, one day a year, but it's deeply meaningful to them because they view it as a time when the Park Service, rather than saying, you all need to come down to us and give us your knowledge, give us your stories and, and help us, they view it as a time of reciprocity and as a gesture on the part of the Park Service to try and return something to the Chinook. And the Chinook also feel as though it's a good opportunity for park staff to actually come to their community and learn directly from them and about them on their territory, rather than just meeting around a consultation table at park headquarters. So the overall arch, the overall thrust of this work really is that um, parks and indigenous peoples can build lasting, positive, good working relationships, but this depends on sustained uh, engagement over a long period of time and it depends on personal investment both from the superintendent and from the park staff. So with that said, I'd be happy to turn it back over to the Dean. We wanted to um, offer these uh, examples of research as a showcase of our amazing masters and PhD students. Uh, we also wanted to give a bit of a uh, a heads up and a nod to um, our Bachelor of Environmental Studies students. Um, and so those students from the Environmental Studies 1200 course have pulled together a composition, a video um, called Cellophims that uh, explores their perspectives on some very pivotal and important issues. So let's take a look at what our Bachelors of Environmental Studies students have been up to in Environmental Studies 1200. Champion sound, yeah, a style we about to get down. get down. Who the hottest in the world right now? Just touch down in London town. <laughs> Bet they give me a pound. Tell them put the money in my hand right now. Yes. Set up a motor, we need more seats. We just sold out all the floor seats. Take me on a trip, I'd like to go someday. Take me to New York, I love. Take me on a trip, I'd like to go someday. Take me to New York, I
Yeah, it's called baby boxes, caskets and coffins for kids and infants. So how do you necessarily think of making a profit with this? Well, with the decline in vaccination rates, we expect a boom in childhood deaths. And... Well, they're all going to need coffins. The numbers speak for themselves. The cash will be rolling in. Thank goodness for the anti-vaccination movement. So many people these days who think that polio and smallpox just went away on their own. I mean, look at measles making a comeback. We are so fortunate that we're able to start this small business. I'm sorry, I won't do it again. I'm sorry I did it because I love you. I'm sorry, but you can't keep talking back. water for our lives. I protect water for future generations. I protect water from Nestle. I protect water for my ancestors. I protect water in solidarity with indigenous communities. Indigenous communities across Canada are fighting to protect their resources from corporations. Support the Water Protectors Movement by visiting honortheearth.com. Check out the various ways you can support Indigenous land struggles, including purchasing merchandise to help fund the movement. Like this 2019 Water is Life calendar by Isaac Murdoch. David Suzuki's Blue Dot organization advocates for people's right to clean water around the world. David Suzuki asks you to send your local MP a pledge for environmental rights. Find a pre-formatted letter online at bluedot.ca. Simply add your name and email address and send it to your local MP to advocate for people's right to clean water. Wellington Water Watchers is an organization based out of Guelph and the surrounding area. For years, Wellington Water Watchers has campaigned against Nestle's bottled water, which the corporation extracts from around Wellington County. Support the water movement and boycott bottled water. Use a water bottle instead. Choose the movement best for you or join them all because water is life. Our dependency on single-use plastic is out of control. It is estimated that a garbage truck worth of plastic is dumped into our oceans every minute. According to the UN Panel of Environment, only 9% of the world's plastic has been recycled, and only about 11% of Canada's. The remaining plastic accumulates in our natural spaces and landfills. Plastic doesn't biodegrade, but instead it breaks down to smaller pieces known as microplastics. Think plastic doesn't affect you? Every piece of plastic ever made still exists today. Microplastics have already been found in our food system, including products such as common table salt, beer, seafood, honey, and both tap and bottled water. Microplastics have been shown to encourage negative health consequences such as heart disease, infertility, obesity, and cancer. The most effective way to combat the consumption of plastic is to reduce the production of new plastics. A report by Environment Defense states that Canada doesn't have a national framework for managing plastics. There is no national recycling target. 
There are no laws that require recycled material be used in the manufacturing of new plastic goods or incentives for producers that use recycled content. There are no national bans on hard to recycle or toxic plastics like PVC and styrene. Stand against single-use plastic by speaking with your local government, supporting an agency that is fighting against plastic, and do your best to reduce your own consumption. As the UN Panel of Environment beautifully said, it is more expensive to clean up tomorrow than to prevent plastic pollution today. Thank you to the students of Environmental Studies 1200 for those very powerful public service announcements that remind us that bodies are the primary environment, that remind us that water and waste and the health of our ecosystem are fundamentally important to our own health and well-being. Please join me in thanking all of our students, Madeline, Victoria, Chance, and those students from 1200 for a wonderful student showcase demonstrating the excellence of environmental studies at York.